Welcome to another video. Um, today we're going to talk about memory, image, sound, and text. And what are we going to talk about them is we're going to talk about how we can store images, how we can store the audio, how we can store text on our computers digitally. So yeah, we're going to learn about how we actually store them on our computer. But before we talk about that, let's first talk about memory units. So uh, we know that in we learn in physics class, everything has a unit, right? For example, speed has the unit of meters per second and time has the meter, has the unit of second. So memory also has units and the unit of memory decides how large a file is, right? So um, everything that is stored on our computer is stored by numbers and they are stored in binary numbers. Uh, if you don't know what binary is, make sure to watch the videos we have sent in the past. But um, we know that all all the files, everything that we store digitally on our computers, they are stored in binary numbers. So therefore, memory units measures the amount of binary numbers, of the amount of binary digits we use to measure the amount of memory you, we use. So. Um, the basic memory unit is called a bit, and one bit is equal to one binary digit. For example, I have a number, let's say 101. This will be equal to three bits because it has three binary digits, right? Three binary digits. If I have a binary number of 1001, it will be equal to four digits, four, four, four bits because it has four binary digits. So, Bit is the smallest and most basic um, unit for memory. You might have, he have heard of it before. But now let's talk about kilobit. One kilobit is equal to a thousand bits, right? So a thousand binary digits. A megabit is equal to a thousand kilobits and a gigabit is equal to a thousand megabits. Um, make sure to memorize these because they might show up on your test. They will ask you like how to uh, ask you for like the size of a file or something. So make sure to remember these. The kilos, the megabits, the gigabits are all 1000 in difference. So um, one megabit is equal to 1000 kilobits. So all 1000 times in difference. A kibby bit, realize the only difference here is uh, here. There's a second bi here. A kibby bit is not 1000 times the, the amount is equal to 1200. Uh, 1024 bits so and a uh, one maybe bit is equal to 1024 kb bits and one gibby bit is equal to 1024 maybe bits so you will see that the ones without this extra bi here the difference is 1000 times but the uh units with this bi existing here right uh, with this extra bi kb bit maybe bit Gigabit, gigabit. With this extra bi here, the difference is a thousand and twenty-four bits. And uh, if you write these as a, um, if you short these, and this will be called a kb. So we see this every day. Kilobit will be equal to a kb. A megabit is equal to mb, and a gigabit is equal to gb. We see these units every day. However, for these, you write kibby bit as a kib. You add an i in the middle due to that extra bi. This maybe bit is the same. It adds an i in the middle. It's called an mib, and this kibby bit is called a gib. All right, that's it. Um, now let's take a look at this. Uh, let's take a look at um, the memory unit of bytes. Now, byte is another essential unit for um, a memory. We talked about bits and other uh, and bytes are also used as memory units. So one byte equals eight bits, so eight binary units. A um, One byte, so for example, I have a number of 10001000 zero, 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 one, zero, 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 has eight binary digits. This uh, requires a memory unit of one byte to store. So one byte is equal to eight bits, which is equal to eight binary digits. The um, pattern here is the same, you know, one kilobyte, a thousand bytes, one megabyte, a thousand kilobytes, and one gigabyte equals to a thousand megabytes. And when you add like a BI here, the times changes to one to 
1024. So the pattern here is the same, but one byte is equal to eight bits. That's the only difference. And you add byte at the end in kind of for bits. And you so you will see that for things uh, for the memory units that has a b extra bi at the end here, uh, extra bi at the end here, the difference will be two one thousand and twenty four times larger, right? For the others though, it will only be a thousand times larger. So that's the difference. Um, now let's talk about the two types of data. Um, so before we talked about memory units, right? The essential things that we use to measure the amount of storage or memory that a file uses. Now we got to talk about types of data. So the, there are two types of data and we want to switch one type of data into another type of data and store them. Analog data is the data that we see in our everyday lives. So things that we use that are hard copies, they are called analog data. We want to switch this analog data into our digital data that can own also which can be stored into the computer systems so or computers. So everything that we see in uh, in our lives they are called analog data and um, we want to turn them into digital data in order to store them. So essentially what we are doing when we store images or when we store sounds or when we store text, we are transferring it from analog data to digital data. And the specific definition for analog and digital is here. Analog data is continuous data that we see in our lives. So uh, data that is continuous, say like our age, our age is continuous. For example, a tune of music, that data is continuous. It does not stop at any point. So music does not stop at any point. Digital data, on the other hand, is non-continuous and represented only by zeros and ones, so binary data. An example of non-continuous data is data that are every data stored on our computers. They are actually non-continuous. So uh, music from our computers are actually non-continuous. We will explain that in more detail later on, but for now, just remember what analog and digital means. So essentially, we say that um, when we store data such as text, images, or audio, we, what we are doing is switching data from analog to digital data. All right, so that's a pre warm up. Uh, it's not that important. Now we dig into the actual important stuff that is, how specifically we can store text, images, and audios in our computer and represent them using numbers. So, how we can represent text using zeros and ones, how we can represent images using zeros and ones, how we represent audio in zeros and ones, right? Now, first, we're going to look at the easiest one, and that is how we store text. We talked before that we want to switch text to, say, the word uh, show. We want to store the word show in our computer. In order to do that, we need to switch it into digital data, which are data that are represented only by zeros and ones. So we need to switch this into a binary number. How do we do that? You say, how do we store show, the word show, or any uh, word or sentences into numbers? How can we do it? Well, what we do is use the thing called an ASCII code. This is very important to remember ASCII code is how we can store words, sentences, text you into numbers. What this ASCII code does is that each character or each letter in our alphabet and lots and punctuations, each letter or punctuation, it corresponds to a 8-bit binary number. So for example, here, the letter A, the character A, is actually represented by this 8-bit binary number. So if I want to store, uh, store for example, I want to store A in our computer, we store A as simply as this list 8-bit binary number. So each letter corresponds to a binary number. Uh, for instance, the letter B is equal to the binary number of 1000011. Zero, 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 zero. This 8-bit binary number is equal to B. So if you want to store A, B, 
as a sentence or phrase in your computer, you simply store the number zero one one uh zero one zero 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 one followed by zero one zero 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 one zero. So essentially, each uh, letter or character or um, punctuation, for example, uh, the ending the a, a question mark, it also corresponds to a number. Everything, every letter, every punctuation, it corresponds to a number, an 8-bit binary number. And when you want to store that letter or you want to store a sentence, you just piece together the binary representation for all the text. All right, so that's how you switch uh, switch uh, text into numbers or how you store text. What you do is you have this sort of like a code which each number uh, or each letter corresponds to a 8-bit binary number and you just piece them all together in order to get the digital representation. All right, now let's take a look at uh, story images. Now this one is a bit more difficult and you want to and there is more vocabulary you need to remember as well. Uh, in the previous one, all you need to remember is that you use ASCII code to represent uh, text and letters into numbers. But for here, you have a um, four major vocabulary. First is a pixel. So the way in which we store images, for example, this panda on the right here, if we want to store this image in our computer, how do we do it? We do it using this thing called a pixel. Now here, you will see that this photo is made up of very, very small squares. Actually, each square is called a pixel. In our computer, our computer screens, these words, they're all made up of small, tiny dots or squares, but they are so tiny that we cannot see it. In this photo, the pixels are a lot larger here. So very large pixels, but every every image that we want to store on computers, on our computer systems, they're all made of pixels. And what is a pixel? It is a tiny dot of uh, color displayed with others to form a picture. So every everything you see stored on computers, stored digitally, it is made of pixels. Okay, so. Um, the way in which we store images using pixels is that each pixel actually is um, representing one color, right? So, you, for example, this uh, white color may be one, and this uh, and black color may be zero. So, the way in which I store this image is writing ones for the um, white colors and black for the a zero, uh, zero for the black colors, and we just piece them all together. So images are all made of pixels. You have to know that, and each pixel is a tiny dot of color, displayed with others to form a picture. Now let's just take a look at this thing called a color resolution. We also talked about how you know every pixel has a certain color, right? And each color is actually represented using a number, a binary number again. So white may be represented by, as we talked here, by the binary number one, and black may be represented by the binary number of zero. So, um, or a more complex image may have like eight colors, so it requires like a bigger, more binary numbers. And what color resolution means is the number of bits used to represent colors. Recall that bits means the number of binary digits, right? So basically, the number of binary digits used to represent colors is the color resolution. Let's look at this picture here and try to figure out its color uh, resolution. We talked about color resolution as the number of bits used to represent the colors. So first, we want to do is we we want to find how many colors there are in this photo. Here we see white and black. So in total, there are two colors. Next, we want to see how many bits or how many binary digits we need, we need or we want to use in order to represent these two colors. So we realize that actually uh, one can be represented, uh, one and zero is enough to represent two colors. So only one bit or one uh, binary digit is needed. So 
a, uh, so this picture has a color resolution of one because only one binary digit is used to represent two colors. For example, if you have a color resolution of two, however, that means you use two bits to represent colors. Now, two bits means two binary digits. You can write it down. You will find that you will, uh, you can actually represent four colors. 0, 0 for one color, 0, 1 for one color, 1, 0 for one color, and 1, 1 for one color. So a color resolution of 2 means that you use two binary digits to represent colors. And we can write it down here, and we realize that you can get four colors, which is 2 to the power of two colors. A color of resolution 3 means that uh, three binary digits are used to represent colors. So if we write 3 here, right? Uh, we can zero zero one. If we write all of the things, there will actually be eight colors you can represent using three binary digits. All right. So that is what color resolution means. It is the number of bits or the number of binary digits used to represent the colors, the amount of colors in the image. So, um, because we know that the more colors we can represent in a photo. We know that the better the photo, would, the more real the photo can be, right? If we only have black and white, you saw these old pictures from like 1900s. Uh, they have these black and white photos. Uh, they only use like two colors. So essentially, they only have like a color resolution of one. But color, uh, but now the photos which are, um, are which have more colors have lots of colors. So the color resolution is higher and the picture is better and more realistic. So you can say that pictures or images with a higher color resolution is better pictures and more clearer, more realistic. And the reason for it is because more colors can be used, right? More colors can be represented. Now let's take a look at image resolution. Uh, this is very important. It is super, super easy. Image resolution just means the number of pixels wide and the number of pixels high in a photo. Let's say in this photo here, the image resolution is the number of pixels wide, so you just count how many pixels are here, and then you count the number of pixels here, and that is your image resolution. And the higher the image resolution, the clearer the picture, because you have more pixels. We know that more pixels you have, the more clearer the photo is, right? Um, so essentially, it's just saying how many pixels there is in this photo. You measure that by measuring the number of pixels wide and high. So higher resolution, clearer photo. The last one is a weird thing called a metadata. When I learned about this, I'm not, uh, I didn't really get it. Uh, still, I don't really get it, but um, basically it means additional information stored around an image. So um, aside from storing just this image here, so for example, I stored this using a pixels, Aside from just storing this image, I store additional data about it. For example, I store along with this image, I can store this is a panda. For example, I can I can store like a additional sentence. This is a panda. Uh, this is a panda along with this photo. So that may be a metadata. So metadata is the additional information stored about the photo. So any additional information, any additional data that is stored about this panda, that may be called metadata. All right, so here the important thing is to know that every image stored on a computer is made up of pixels, which are small, tiny dots of color. Right? As you can see here, it is made up lots of pixels. Every Im image you see is made of pixels. Each pixel has a corresponding number, and that is number represents a certain color. And that's how we get color resolution. Color resolution is the a uh, number of bits that we use to represent the amount of colors we use in the photo. And the higher the color resolution means the more colors we can use in the photo leads to a better and more realistic photo, photo or picture. Image resolution is the number of pixels wide and high, and the more, the higher the resolution means the more pixels there are in the photo, which means the clearer the picture is. And finally, metadata is the additional information stored by the image. All right, so that's about it for this um, story images. Uh, quite a wordy one, but um, this is, uh, now let's look at the final one, story sounds. This is the most important one, and it's commonly you know, tested on exams. So 
super important. And this one's the actual one you actually need to understand. So I make sure to understand this one. Last few ones, if you just memorize the definitions, you, I think you'll get away with it. But this one you have to understand. Now, talk about storing sounds. We talked about what analog data is before. Analog data is continuous data we see in our lives. And I talked about how music is analog data because it continues to flow. Music never stops at any point, right? If you, if you know, have a violin here, for example, and you play the violin full stroke, the violin music will continue continuously when you play the stroke. It will never at any moment stop or stop existing. However, we know that the computer cannot store non-continuous stuff because it's stored using numbers and numbers are finite and you cannot store, you know, infinite stuff using just binary numbers. So what we want to do when we want to store sounds is we want to try and make this, you know, violin music or anything. We want to make audio, which is analog data and continuous, you know, music, continuous music. We want to sort of switch this music into non-continuous music which will essentially make it digital. So how do we make it uh, from an analog and continuous flow of music into, you know, digital music, which is non-continuous? We use something called sound sampling. This is really, really important. Sound sampling. Sound sampling is the method that we use to convert this flowing, non-continuous music into digital music, which is non-continuous. And um, how it does this, and I'll show you more detail later. And for now, for example, I have like this music right here, right? And here on the y-axis, you know, is the pitch. So how high the note is, is the note. Or let's just say on the y-axis, it's a note, right? The note of the music. And it's constantly flowing, it's flowing, it's flowing and here the time right as time goes on the music continues to flow it is non-continuous how can we store this non-continuous ugly thing we cannot we have to split it up and that's how sound sampling works it splits this non-continuous piece of music up into intervals for example i at this point i record the note of the music and after the same amount of time, I record the note of the music again. After the same amount of time, I record the sound of the music again, the note again, and I record again and again and again. So I continue recording the music, but only at certain times. So I do not record the music in the middle between these points. I only record the notes at certain points, at certain intervals. Right, I only record the notes and points at certain intervals. So now you will see that you can actually record the note, right? You can record the note here, 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 the note here. You don't need to care about the music in the middle. So then you will see that it largely basically coincides with the actual music. Right? So if you connect these dots, you'll see that the, the notes you collect is actually basically the same as the original music. So that's how sound sampling works. You have a original flowing music. You break it up into chunks and you only measure the note at certain points. If you want to measure the note in everything between, it's impossible. So you only measure it at certain points and you leave blanks in the middle. Now let's take a look at more detailed example here. This is, I absolutely love this photo. And um, so this is the perfect photo to explain what sound sampling is. Don't care about the thing on the top. Uh, it's nothing to do with it. So this underlying blue thing, this is, is analog um, audio. It's just the music we hear every day. It's like, ah, 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 right? It's the music we hear every day. It's continuous. If we want to record this continuous piece of music, it's impossible. So as we do last time, we record this music at certain times. So I record the note of the music here. I record the note of the music here again, the note of the music here again. And I only record the note of the music at certain points, right? 
only at certain points. And then I connect all these notes to make the music I want. So sound sampling basically is recording the music, the note of the music at certain, certain points, right? And the music I collect will be largely similar to the original music because the blanks are too less and, you know, it's basically the same. All right, so um, this is how sam sampling works. Um, this is how sound sampling works. You, you chunk up, you split this continuous piece of music into small pieces, and then you only record the notes at these intervals. So that's the essentials of sound sampling. So we talked about how you can, you know, uh, get, get, you know, chunk these up and record the notes at these intervals. But how do we record these notes? Even if we know the note here, the note here, the note here, and the note here, if we know the notes at every single uh, interval, every single point, we still cannot, um, uh, you know, you know, record this in our computers, right? How do we record a note in our computer? I can say, can write, tell the, tell the computer to. Remember, yes, right now, at this point, the uh, violin is playing a C minus. Impossible. So now we're going to talk about how you can, you can store these notes at certain points uh, into the computer. So um, what we do here is the same thing as what we have done before. So we know that in text, each letter corresponds to a um, number. In images, each color represents a number. In sound, each note represents a, uh, a, a number. So every note, for example, C minus will be given a binary number, you know, D sharp may be given a binary number. So all of these notes will be given a certain binary number. And they will be stored, these C minus, D sharps, they will be stored in the computer as these binary numbers. And there's this thing called a sample resolution. And the sample resolution is very similar to the color resolution we talked about. We said the color resolution is the number of bits we use to store the number of colors. Here, the first part is the same, the total number of bits used to store but the number of sounds. So, if, for example, I want to store eight different sounds. I want eight different notes. Let's say I want to store A, B, C, D, E, F, C, D, F, G, A, B. I want to store the seven seven notes. Um, then let's we just gotta calculate how many bits you need to store the number of notes you wanna you wanna store. And as with color, uh, you know, color resolution, the more notes you can represent using numbers then more notes you can say for example now i can represent d sharp as well i will have better music quality because i can you know store more sounds store more notes all right so that is sample resolution is the total number of bits used to store the number of sounds in the music let's say i have for example i want to store eight notes i want to store c d f j b and d sharp then Let's just say how many uh, bits we need to store, you know, eight sounds. There's a very simple method. Um, the bits we say is the number of binary digits, right? And actually, you just got to say how many uh, two to the power of what? Two to, two to the power of what is equal to eight to store. So two to the power of three we know is equal to eight, right? So you will take three binary digits to store a number. So the sample resolution will be three. All right. So that's sampling resolu sample resolution. There is a thing that we didn't talk about when we store um, images, and that is sampling rate. Sampling rate has to do with the intervals we talked about. So this determines how many notes we can, you know, have in our music, right? Here we say how often do we record the notes where we, you know, sample the uh, analog data? How many, you know, sounds do we record every second? Let's see here. Um, let's take a look at the this example here. For example, I here I'm also sampling notes, right? I'm taking notes here, taking a note here, 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 here. So sampling rate is the amount of notes or the amount of sounds that you record in a second. So here, you say here is one second, 
if you categorize years, you'll realize that here it recorded a note, here it recorded a note, here it recorded a note, three, four, five, six, seven, eight, nine, ten, eleven, and twelve. Therefore, we can say that twelve notes or at twelve points, this sound sampling process of recorded notes in one second. Therefore, we can say that the uh, sampling rate for this um, piece of sampling is equal to 12 per second. All right, that's what sampling rate means. And now you will say that because you sample more notes, you take more notes in one second, of obviously the music quality will become better. So, um, so two factors will come contribute to the quality of sounds, and that is the first sampling rate, and the second one is sample resolution. All right, that's it for today's video. Hope you learned something from it. Uh, make sure to like and subscribe if you enjoyed, and I'll see you next time.